friend named Roger. He said, this is my body broken for you. As long as you eat it, Lord, do so in remembrance of me. You know, it's many times I identify with Paul. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. same way after supper he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Father God, thank you that you sent Jesus to pay for our sins and the blood of Christ cleanses us Lord, this morning we come to you wretched and sinful people and we ask that you would cleanse us, that you would create within us, God, a clean heart, that you would renew a right spirit within us, God, that you would renew our minds, Lord, that we would serve you as pleasing children. Thank you, Lord, for second chances. Thank you, Lord, that every day your mercies are new. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the cup. God bless you. Thank you guys so much for that worship. Jan, thank you. Turn to the Genesis chapter 3, and we will continue our incredible series through the whole Bible. It will take us a millennia. But we will get there. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. And we made it, I believe, to verse 19. Verse 20. Now the man called his wife, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. There has been theories that there were other people created and were on planet Earth uh, when Adam and Eve sinned. And the reason why is we're going to get into Cain, after he slew his brother, took his wife and went to the land of Nod. Well, where did Cain get his wife? That's a good question. And we need to address that question, and we will, but it's amazing to me that Eve is the mother of all the living. You know, science uh, by mitochondria DNA has established that all of mankind, every person on the planet, and they did a survey genetically of all these people, came from one female. Isn't that amazing? That science has now established that? I think it's remarkable. Turn back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, Who is this woman? 
We just read about her. Eve, the mother of all the living, including you and I. She is our great, 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 who knows how long, grandma. I can't wait to get to that marriage supper of the Lamb and talk to Eve. You know, I don't know about you, but I just want to ask her, why did you believe Satan? I want to ask you a question right now. Did Satan lie when he tempted Eve? Be careful before you answer it. Let's read it. Continue on. The woman said to the serpent, chapter 3, verse 2, some of you are going, I thought we were at verse 20. How come we're going back? <laughs> well, we'll get there. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it. Or, she added this, legalism, touch it. <laughs> we talked about that last week, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. And the definition of die is to be utterly destroyed, to cease to exist. What happened when Eve ate the fruit? Did she die? Physically, no. She did not immediately die. So she thought Satan told her the truth. He's right. I took a bite. I didn't die. Here, Adam, eat. Look, I'm still alive. I took a bite. In fact, Satan didn't lie to Continue on. For God knows the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Is that the truth? Absolutely. So did Satan lie to Eve when he tempted her? It's kind of a trick question. Yeah, death came to all mankind because they sinned, right? But it wasn't immediate, and God, the way he stated it, it seemed to be an immediate consequence of sin. And the enemy tempts you the same way. Well, really? You shouldn't do this? Well, try it. See, isn't God still blessing you? Isn't his grace and his mercy still? And all of a sudden, you're sucked into practicing sin, like Eve and Adam were. Uh, the enemy is tricky like that, isn't he? Okay, back to chapter 3, verse 20. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Science established that. Look it up, mitochondria DNA. Verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Why did he do that? They now knew that they knew enough to be embarrassed now. Because they were naked. Right. Yeah, they, they got the knowledge of good and evil. They realized they were naked. They hid from God. Have you ever hidden from God? I have. It's like, you know, where can you go from this presence? So, even if you go to Sheol, guess what? He's there. He's there. <laughs> you can't hide from God. You can't hide from God at all. But there's something more important. Because of their sin, death had to come, and the animal that God killed to make their clothes became the propitiation, the payment for their sin. So God shed grace on them, and instead of them dying, something had to die, an animal died in their place. That's why eventually in Levitical law, we're going to have the whole sacrificial system uh, initiated by God. You and I, someone died in our place. We just took communion, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood was shed. We deserve death, right? But because of God's mercy, its mercy is what? Not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Because of God's mercy, Christ made a payment for our sin. So let me tell you this. You can't earn God's love. Adam and Eve tried to sow fig leaves together. God said, it's not good enough. Your works, man, they're like filthy rags. They're like fig leaves sewn together. They're not going to cover anything, but let me make a garment for you from this animal that had to die in your place so death did come. And God made the garment. What garment do we wear today? 
The righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. When we receive them, we are given that righteousness. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, um, but it's pretty amazing. Continue on. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, exactly what Satan said. Hey, if you eat of it, he knows you're going to be just like him, knowing good and evil. That he might stretch out his hand and therefore take the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground uh, from which he was taken. Two things. They didn't die physically, right? But they did die what? Spiritually. Spiritually. They were cut off from relationship with God. Now let me ask you this. Sin entered the world through this. We're going to get to the verses. Did Adam and Eve still love God? Yes. Did they still want to please God? Absolutely. Did Cain and Abel love God? We're going to get into it. Just hold the thought. Verse 24. So he drove men out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed a cherubim with a flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. You know one day we're going to eat of that tree? In Revelation in chapter 2, verse 7, it's told to him who overcomes, he'll be granted to eat of the tree of life. Wow. Did, did they have to leave the garden because if they kept eating the tree of life, they would forever? Right, right. That's, that's pretty much what he's saying. That they'll live forever if they, if they eat of the tree of life. And we know uh, in the New Jerusalem, the tree of life will grow on either side of the stream, flowing from the river, uh, coming from the throne of God. And it will be for healing of the nations. And every month it will bear 12 kinds of fruit. We're going to live in this great new Jerusalem and partake of the tree of life for eternity. Wow. That's the problem for them would be living in a compromised lifestyle for eternity. Yeah, because they weren't glorified. They literally now introduce sin to mankind. And we got our sin nature. Okay, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Verse 2. And again she gave birth to her, his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. Did Cain love the Lord? Yeah, he's actually bringing an offering to the Lord. But we're going to find out Cain did a lot of bad things. Not just kill his brother. In fact, we're told that he was evil. It's very interesting to me in verse 3 where it says, So it came about in the course of time. Possibly that could have been a hundred years. As we examine this and get into that uh, uh, chapter 5, we'll get into the time that was there. And Eve had many other children during this time. Thus Cain had a wife in the course of time. Does that make sense? It's the only place where we can get a wife for Cain and Abel and other people on the planet. It had to be in verse 3. Through the course of time, possibly 100 years. Continue on. Verse 4. Abel on his part also brought of the first slings of his flock and their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Why do you think God regarded Abel's offering and not Cain's? He requires blood. Huh? He requires blood. Blood, but now there's also sheath yeah. offerings, there's drink offerings to the Lord. Oh. There's, what's that? There's a quality of the, the fact that it was uh, the best. Let me suggest to you this. It was not the offering that mattered. It was the character of the man bringing the offering. There could be a guy, I got a call and I told you guys this story. He said, uh, Pastor Brett, I've been listening to your sermons online. I want to come to your church. I'm, I am a very rich man, wealthy man in Irvine. 
I can build you a church. I can buy you land. I'm going to come to your church. One, one thing, though, uh, you have to accept my partner, too. Your business partner? No, my sexual partner. Homosexual guy. And I said, let, let me tell you this. You can come. We're going to love you. We're going to embrace you. Definitely write a tie check as soon as you come. <laughs> um, we're going to love you. We're going to embrace you. Yeah, man, it, it's going to be awesome. The first Sunday. And I'll say, you need to repent and stop living in sin. You come back. I'm going to bring a couple of the elders with me. We'll pull you outside. Say, hey, did you, did you move out? Have you repented? If you haven't, uh, you go your way and we'll warn you. If you don't repent, you can't come back. Simply, that's the thing. It's the character of the man or woman that brings the offering. And that's why God judged Cain and didn't receive his offering and received Abel's offering. It wasn't the offering. It wasn't because Abel shed blood and Cain brought fruit. But it was a character of the man. Let me establish that for you. Turn, if you would, quickly to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. What the idea that uh, Cain made that new sacrifice or his gift came from the world of God. So you realize that his offering was from the Lord. That's possible, and we're going to get into that. Hebrews chapter 11, even start at verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. First of all, it was the character of the man and faith. Are you with me? Continue on. Through which he obtained a testimony that he was what? Righteous. Let me ask you this. How can a son of Adam, right after the fall, where sin is probably at its height, be considered righteous? He's not mistaken God. By faith. Exactly. Okay, even in the old covenant, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Can we say that? Absolutely. Yeah, we can say that. Okay. Continue on. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. And we know that God said his blood cries out to me, right? Okay, back to Genesis. Or you know what? Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. Well, now, let's go back to Genesis. I was, I was going to preach, and the Lord just said, no, don't preach, just teach right now. We're teaching, we're not preaching. Okay. We will preach, but for now we're teaching. Genesis 4.4 4. Abel on his part brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel, character of a man, and, by the way, his offering. Go back to verse 3. Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. But what did God say about Cain's offering? Go to verse 5. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Boy, it's kind of reminiscent of Jacob by love. He saw, I hated Romans chapter 9. Before they did anything good or bad while they were still in their mother's womb. So why did God have regard for Abel and not Cain? They both brought offerings to the Lord. Abel's heart was right before God. Cain's heart was not. Exactly. It was the character of the man. And let me really establish that. Turn it to it quickly to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. All the way back after Hebrews. After Peter. Close to the book of Revelation. First John chapter 3, verse 12. You read this. Even go to 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, 
who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Now we're going to know the character of the man, Cain. Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. You know, whatever you have to bring to the table for the Lord, and there's some people that are talented. They, they bring a beautiful voice or the ability to play the keyboard or the djembe. And there's other people that really don't feel too talented. I can't sing, can't dance, can't chew, can't go with girls or do. Oh, no, that's something else. <laughs> Who remembers that saying? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, us legalists back in the day, right? You get caught in a movie theater, you go burn in hell. Uh, that's funny. I forgot where I was. Oh, yeah. The character of the man. You see, Cain was evil. We don't know what he did. The Bible doesn't record it. But God knows. And that's why when Cain brought his gift, it wasn't the gift. It was the character of who he was. And folks, when we come before the Lord, it doesn't matter what you have to give. You can be poor and give like that widow's wife. You know, that one thing. And remember, Jesus said, see that woman? She gave more than anyone else. In comparison, let's just say it'd be like you come to church and all you have is a penny. And you drop it in the offering and there's someone here that has a lot and gives little. Boy, the Lord regards not the gift, but the character of the person who gives the gift. Meaning you can't earn God's love. Well, God, I not only pay 10%, I pay 30%. And I spend two hours a day in prayer. And I read 10 chapters a day. And I help the poor. And I do all these things. Aren't I wonderful? And just like Cain, he sweated. He did all this work. And he goes to God, even though he had an evil heart, right? He goes to God and said, here's my offer. Look what I did. God said, I don't regard it. Because it's not the gift. It's the character of the man or woman who gives a gift. Are you getting that? Very important. How's your character this morning? Go to verses 3 and 4 of uh, 1 John chapter 3. We just read about Cain in 1 John chapter 3 verse 12. 3 and 4 we read this, And everyone who has this hope, that's in the resurrection of Christ, fixed on Him, purifies Himself just as He is pure. What does it mean to purify yourself? You ever done it? Have you ever practiced a sin? I don't want you to answer it. Just think about it. Lord, your grace is sufficient. I have freedom to do this sin. I'm going to do it. And all of a sudden, God brings conviction to your heart and you purify yourself before the Lord. You repent of that sin. And repentance means what? To turn 180 degrees, go the different direction. It doesn't mean I'm headed this direction. Oh, forgive me. I'll do it again tomorrow. It says I'm going to try never to do that thing again. Repentance is so important. He who purifies himself uh, is pure. Verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And this is very important. And sin, here we get the definition of sin, is what? Lawlessness. Now this is going to be important as we continue to discuss this. In fact, I would suggest to you that you have to know the law in order to break the law. Does that make sense? And if you don't know the law, what does that mean? Can you sin? If sin is lawlessness, and literally it's disobedience to the law, that's what he's saying there. If you do not know the law, can you sin? Turn to Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 12. Romans. 
we read this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, we just read about it when Adam and Eve sinned, and death through sin. Remember the definition of sin? Could we fill it in here? Therefore, just as through one man disobedience to the law, literally lawlessness, entered the world. Are you with me? And death through lawlessness, because sin is lawlessness. And so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. And we know that Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have what? Sin and fall short of the glory of God. But in order to sin, you have to break the law and you have to consciously do so. So you have to know the law in order to break it. Some of you are saying, are you sure? I don't know about that. Well, let's see what Paul has to say. Read on. Verse 13, Romans chapter 5. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not, is not, literally was and is a continual uh, passive, no, passive area, <laughs> no, a present indicative uh, aorist tense, meaning it goes on. So literally, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. This is deep stuff. If sin is breaking the law, you have to know the law in order to break it. Thus, if there is no law, there is no sin. It's not imputed even from Adam because you have to know the law in order to break it. It's not like in America where it says ignorance of the law is no excuse because God has put his law in every man's heart. I'm going to give you the verse in a minute. In fact, in Romans we read, every man is without excuse. The law of God is placed in our heart. What's imputed to man? God's law. And once they receive by faith Christ, his righteousness is imputed. Absolutely. Now, continue with me. This is really deep, really good. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Adam's descendants couldn't sin because the one law God gave mankind at that time was what? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They couldn't sin. They couldn't even be tempted because they couldn't get back to the Garden of Eden to do it. Let me suggest to you this. That because Adam and Eve sinned, we are born with a sin nature and the capacity more than that, the knowledge that we will all sin. Okay, hold that thought. Skip down to verse 18. Actually, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of one, the many died. What does he mean by the many? Could we say all? Yeah, everybody. Much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Can we say everyone, all mankind? Okay. Now, there are those scholars that say, oh, no, no, not all mankind did the gift. Only those that are predestined. Go down to verse 18. So then, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to whom? All men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification to life to who? It's very clear. All men. Not just the elect, not just whoever, but to all men. Now, I'm not talking about universalism here. Let's continue on. Verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, remember, sin is what? Disobedience. Lawlessness is disobedience to a law that you know you should not break. That is what sin is. It's missing the mark. What's the mark? The law. Continue on. 
Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. So what is the deciding factor? Peter said it like this. Turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 34. People coming late to church. I can't believe it. It's my parents. <laughs> Drove all morning from... Drove down from Taft. How's it going, guys? Great. Good. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Hmm. You know, there are those that teach God shows partiality. In fact, elsewhere we read he's not the respecter of persons. Continue on, verse 35. But in every nation on the planet, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Isn't that an amazing thing? That every nation on planet Earth, the one who fears God, the one who does what is right, obedience to the law, is welcome to him. Turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 14. Cain's offering was not accepted, not because of the offering, but because of the character of the man. Abel's offering was accepted, not because of the offering, but because of the character of the man. In fact, throughout the Word of God, people are always given a choice. I will be pleasing to God or I will please myself. And if you are striving to please God, whatever offering you bring to Him, it's accepted. But if you are all about yourself and building your own kingdom, whatever offering you bring to God, it's not acceptable just like Cain's. Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and forward says this, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. In fact, we have cultures that literally the Ten Commandments are part of that culture. We found that in sociological and anthropological studies. Continue on, verse 15. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, oh, everyone has a conscience. Guess what that is? It is God's law in us that brings conviction when we do something wrong. You ever had your con Do you remember the first time you were about to do something wrong and you felt conviction? I shouldn't do this. I remember I was a little kid. I don't remember what age, and I don't remember what I was going to do. But I do remember this. I was about to do something, and I felt that still small bird voice say, stop, do not, this is wrong. And I'm like, where did that come from? I want to do it. And it was like, no, this is wrong. You ever, do you remember when the conscience spoke to you so clearly? What happens to a reprobate man? By the way, you're not born reprobate. God has to turn people over to a reprobate mind. Do you know that? Through consciously making a decision to harden your heart against the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Every atheist I've ever met, I've asked them, when did you stop believing in God? Want to know what's cool? Every one of them has an answer that I've found so far. As a child, they believed, they felt God, they felt a conviction from God, they felt a sense of right and wrong, and at some point, through hardening their hearts against God, they became calloused, and they were turned over to a reprobate mind. The Bible talks about that. We'll get there. Hopefully. Hopefully. What time is it? Oh, yeah, we have plenty of time. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Verse 16. Romans chapter 2. So that on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. 
they are going to be judged according to how they obeyed the law that God placed in their heart, even though they never heard the law. So let me ask you this. If sin is lawlessness, and God has placed His law in every person's heart on the planet, ah, here's where we're all guilty. If His law is placed in our heart, then we know the law. So when we're born and we reach the age where we make a decision to transgress God's law, which we all do, we've sinned. Because now the law is built into us. So if sin is disobedience to the law, and Paul said in Romans 5, without the law there is no sin, but if God gave us His law to every man and we transgress the law, then we're all sinners. Does that make sense? Okay, so now it fits together. Okay, continue on. Well, actually go to uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It's not the gift, but it's the character of the man that matters. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It's who you are in here that matters. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. First of all, then, I urge entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority. Should we be praying for our president? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires who? All men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Is God a liar? What's God's will? Let me ask you right now. Is it for all men everywhere to be saved? I don't want you to raise your hand. I want you to consider it. What about John chapter 6, verse 44? Why don't you turn there? Mainly I'm reading scripture. I'm trying not to comment too much. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the theory is God only draws the elect and everyone else he doesn't. But if it's his will for all men to be saved, and Christ died for all men, and through the transgression of one, we read it, Adam, all men will die. The same passage says, but through the righteousness, the obedience of the one, all men will live. Are you getting the pattern? No one comes to the Father Oh, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let me ask you this. Is every man on the planet, woman and child, being drawn to God by the Holy Spirit? I really believe it. But I can prove it. Turn to John chapter 12, verse 32. You see, belief is simply an opinion. But real faith and truth is belief plus proof. John chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. So let's get the picture. Cain and Abel are an example, and that's what we're really studying today, of all mankind. Sons of Adam. Born with the ability to sin, let's call it a sinful nature. Born with the law of God placed on their heart. Cain transgressed the law consistently and thought by his hard work in presenting an offering to God that God would accept them. Abel honored God, obeyed the law that God put in his heart, and because of his faith in God, brought his offering to the table. So they both believed that God brought offerings to the table. But God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's because of the character 
of the man, not because of the significance of the offer. So Jesus will draw all men unto himself if he's lifted up, dies on the cross. Some say this only applies to believers. It's called limited atonement. I won't talk about flowers here this morning. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Some of you are like flowers. You know the tulip? 1 John 2, 2. Sophia would be more apt to talk about flowers than I because she grows some beautiful ones. Even start at verse 1, 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things so that, <clears throat> thanks to you, so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the payment. Remember in the garden? God slew the animal and made coverings for Adam and Eve, and that was their payment for sin. Death did come immediately through the animal, and eventually through now, death is in the world. So they did die. But now Christ is our propitiation for our sins, and not only ours only, but who? The world. Those of the whole world. There's not limited atonement, folks. Continue on, verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we do what? Keep His commandments. That's why James talks about faith without works is dead. In fact, when you have become born again, your whole life is about pleasing God. It doesn't become legalistic works. It becomes naturally who you are. You want to please God. And yes, we fight our sinful nature. We all inherited that from Adam. And we all fail. And we all sin. That's why he says in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2, that if you sin, you've got an advocate. The Lord Jesus Christ. He already paid for it. Amen? Verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. To be condemned, you have to make a choice not to believe. Because if you believe, you will obey. Turn to Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Actually, start at verse 14. After he appeared to the eleven themselves, Mark chapter 16, verse 14. As they were reclining at the table, he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. He's talking to the disciples there. Isn't that amazing? They had did what? in their heart in unbelief verse 15 and he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation he who is, has believed and has been baptized shall be saved but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned I believe that God gives every man woman and child on the planet a choice it's not about their gift. It's not about what they do. But it's about the character of who they are. In fact, the Bible is clear. It's to all the world that Christ died. It's for all the world that He died. You cannot say if Adam's transgression affected all mankind when the same verse in Romans says, and through Christ's uh, obedience and and." Uh, Payment affected all mankind. There is no two ways to interpret that. So then the question is this. If a baby dies, does that baby go to heaven or hell? 
There are those that believe that children, not having the law, they don't know knowledge of good or evil. That baby is burning in hell today, and those people love tulips. Because a lot of Calvinists, not all, say that we are so reprobate from inherited sin from Adam that we cannot choose to do good. Yet the Bible, we just read many verses that contradict that teaching. I want to quickly examine why I believe babies go to heaven. And it's a lot of verses, so I had to put it on a PowerPoint. Now, for those of you that tend to be Calvinistic, please uh, don't be angry with me. Uh, I can debate with you. We can sit down and talk. I know I ignored a lot of the verses that talk about that, uh, well, Romans chapter 9. Um, by the way, that's dealing with nations, not individuals. God predestines nations for wrath and destruction. Individuals, though, we already read, uh, Peter said it in Acts, that, hey, there's people in every nation on the planet, if they fear God and are obedient to Him, they will be saved. It doesn't matter, but nations He does. We're not going to get into that today because we don't have time. Salvation by faith and salvation through faith are two different Gospels. They're not the same. The fact is all about free will. Once you are able to make the choice. Before you can make the choice, how can God judge you? But I'm going to give you verses that establish that babies, children that die, before they reach the age of accountability, will be in heaven. All right. Here's uh, two verses that a lot of people use to say no babies are going to burn in hell. Child, when it dies before the... It doesn't matter the age of accountability. They have Adam's imputed sin. Therefore, since they don't have faith, they will die. That's what they say. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Okay, that's David writing. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. Okay, it sounds exactly like that. There are those that are not part of the elect, that even though they're a baby and don't know good or bad and never did anything wrong, they will burn in hell forever. That's the theory. Let's explain these verses. Both of these verses are Hebrew poetic form, and it's a hyperbole. If you've studied hermeneutics, the science of interpreting scripture, you know what this is. A hyperbole is simply this. And you've said it before, I've said it, it's like when a commander of the battalion says to one of his soldiers, he needs to go and spot a field before, before them and asks, are you ready to go fight and possibly die? And he responds with this, I was born red. You ever hear that? I was born red. Was he literally from his mother's womb, born ready to go die on the field of battle? No, it was a hyperbole. It was an expression just like Psalms 51 and Psalms 58. They were simply hyperbolic expressions. He was so evil that from his mother's womb he was evil. And in fact, David says this. Oh, by the way, he wasn't referring to his own sinfulness, but the environment that he was conceived in. We are born into a world of wrath and sin and destruction and evil and all of that. And possibly even a reference to his mother's sin because it says... He was conceived in sin. Okay. Fact is, David said he served God from his mother's womb. Psalm 22, 9. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. That's David right. Okay. Hyperbole is not truth. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. <laughs> Someday, someone's going to hear this message and say, man, no wonder that pastor was gaining weight because he can eat a whole horse. <laughs> Hyperbole. That's all it is. If people were born totally depraved and sinful, why would God have to turn them over to a depraved mind? We already gave one verse. Here's another one, Romans 1.28. 
And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that the thing, they would do the things which are not proper. Meaning they didn't have a depraved mind. God had to turn them over to it. Continue on. Charles Spurgeon once wrote this, I rejoice to know that the souls of all infants, as soon as they die, speed their way to paradise. Think what a multitude there is of them. Isn't that great? Why would Jesus tell us we had to become like children if they're born totally depraved? He wouldn't. If a child is too young to know right and wrong and they're so depraved that they couldn't choose to do right even if they had the opportunity, why would God say at that time the disciples came and Jesus said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to himself and set him before them. And he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, totally depraved, unable to choose good, good they don't know right or wrong, they're innocent, what, what? Are you with me on this? Okay. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Whoever then humbles himself as a child is greatest in the kingdom of God. Some children, they seem like they're totally born devils. I know. <laughs> I've met them. Other children, it seems like they were born little angels. They do everything right, and the minute they try to transgress the law of the house or what you want, all you have to do is look at them. And they know immediately and are humble and repentant, and they do what's right. It's not the gift, it's the character of the man that counts. Humility. Humility is one of the most difficult qualities to have as a Christian. Because pride always comes in. Yet Jesus said, these little children, humble yourself like them. Deuteronomy 138, Joshua the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there, encourage him for he will cause all Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones who you said would become prey and your sons who this day have no knowledge of good or evil shall enter there and I will give it to them and they will possess it. Talking about the promised land. Still referring to little ones, they have no knowledge of good or evil. What's the sin? Eating the fruit and getting the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot transgress the law if you do not know the law. If you're too young to know the difference between right and wrong, there can be no sin because sin is disobedience to a known law. Are you with me? That's what I've been trying to say this whole time. I'm confused. God is impartial when he judges, meaning he will judge according to each person's choice. 1 Peter 1.17, if you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, the entire uh, a race of people, all mankind will be judged. We read it in Romans chapter 2 as well. Those who do not have the law, who obey instinctively the law that God placed in their heart, will be judged according to how they obey that law. Haven't you ever wondered, on judgment day, when Jesus says, well, you have faith in me, enter in. By the way, judgment, I'm talking about the white throne at the end where he separates the sheep and the goats. What are they going to be judged by? Works. You gave a cup of water to one of these. You did it unto me. You did this. You did it unto me. Well, when did we do that? When you did it to one of the least of these. You did it unto me. They will be judged by works. The world even though maybe they don't have the law, but they do have the law of God placed in their heart, they will be judged on how they obey that law. They can't be part of the church. We know that on the new earth, the church lives in the new Jerusalem. But haven't you ever wondered who the nations are that live on the new earth that aren't part of the church, part of the redeemed, part of the saved? You and I. They must be those that obeyed the law of God. Are you with me? And God will judge them accordingly. So not only will babies go to heaven. By the way, I'm going to do a verse that proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Babies 
And anyone that dies before the age of accountability, they will go to hell. You will see your lost children. Those of you that have lost children, like Cheryl and I have lost a child when it was still in her womb, but uh, we're going to see that. partially judges. Everything is all about free will and being old enough to choose. Deuteronomy 30, 19 I will call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life or death, blessings or curses. Choose this day in order that you may live you and your descendants. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, who they serve beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in the land of the living, but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord. We have a choice to make. Children have to be old enough to choose. Sin is knowing the law and disobeying obeying it. It's missing the mark, and the mark is the law. First John, we read it, sin equals lawlessness, disobedience to the law. Isaiah 7, 15, he will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and good. So there comes a time in a child's life where they reach that age of accountability where they know how to choose between good and evil. But until that time, they are innocent before a holy and merciful and gracious God. We're plainly told that they do not inherit the sins of their fathers. Ezekiel 18.20 The soul of... Uh, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. By the way, father in Hebrew literally means forefathers, plural. It's their grandfather. It's their great, great, great grandfather. It's Adam. Hmm. What did we get from Adam? The curse. All of us were still under the curse. Death. In fact, we read it in Romans chapter 5 that death spread to all mankind through Adam. Right? What else did we get from Adam? The capacity to sin. Most people call that a sinful nature. What it really is is we're going to sin. We're selfish. Once we reach that age, we are going to try to please ourselves. We are all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> uh, if God knowing all things could uh, be the future to see that one particular person wasn't going to accept his son and therefore die and go to hell. But being that God wants all men but here, here's the, the problem with that question. And, and just, just so you guys hear the question, it's like if, if a baby was, was in the womb or, or was still a child, but God knew because of foreknowledge whether they would accept and they die, then based on the foreknowledge of that acceptance, where would they go? Got it. But God knew and only knew, couldn't know anything else that they were going to die. Still in that innocent state. Does that make sense? So there was no, there, there could be no theory that, well, he know what they would have cho chose because in his foreknowledge, he knew they would die. The quick answer, but we, talk to me afterwards. <coughs> Ezekiel 18, I, I would encourage you to read that, okay, later, because it really talks about that you will not be held accountable for the sins of your fathers, and that includes Adam. You will be held accountable by what you do with what God has given you individually. And you can read it later. It's so clear. Ezekiel 18. By the way, Ezekiel 18, 21. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins, uh, which he has committed, and observes my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he will surely live, and he shall not die. Um, all right. So is there any indication that children for the age of accountability go to heaven. There's one passage that clearly states it. There's no doubt uh, David knew children go to heaven. What goes to go to heaven? It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 22 through 23. What's the story? David has sex with another man's wife, 
that he lusted after and wanted. Then he killed the man. They had a baby. Was that baby born in sin and iniquity? I can tell you what, it was conceived in sin. If there's any baby that, if babies don't go to heaven, this baby would. Conceived in sin, it's horrible. The baby got sick. David fasted and prayed and wept and wet his clothes for this child as it was dying. And finally they came in and said, hey, the child's dead. What did David do? Oh, he got up and washed and oh, ah, he was he was good. No, like, what? Why did you grieve when the child was alive, but now that the child's dead, you are okay? And David said what? Hey, because while he was alive, there was a chance God might heal him. So I wept and I fasted and I prayed. But once the child died, oh, I can't bring him back from the dead, but I will see him again in heaven. How do we know heaven? Well, where did David go? And David knew he would see this child. There's no question. There's no doubt. Children that are innocent before they can choose to obey or disobey the law will go to heaven. Jesus states, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, children, for I say unto you that in heaven there are angels. Isn't it neat that children have guardian angels? Their angels do always behold the face of my Father. That's every child. Hebrews 1.14 Angels, by the way, are defined as ministering spirits sent forth to minister to who? Heirs of salvation. It's very clear. So every child, before they reach the age of accountability, has a guardian angel. They're an heir of salvation. They're not held accountable for their father's sin. But once they transgress the law, what happens? They're in need of a redeemer. They're in need of a savior. Because they have a sinful nature. If they live... They will transgress the law. They will sin. We are all sinners. All right. Let's sum it up here really quick. Ezekiel 7.29. Behold, I found out only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. Zechariah 12.1. The burden of the Lord uh, concerning Israel, thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth. I don't know why I said that. We've got to hurry, though. <clears throat> For you formed me in my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. Isn't that neat that God makes children? Can God create evil? No way. Let me prove it. Psalm 139, 14, the next verse. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That word wonderfully is very important to understanding what we talk about right now. Wonderful are your works. They're good. And my soul knows it very well. Babies born in the womb, being formed, are good. They're wonderful. And by the way, that word in the Hebrew means to set apart. Interesting. What is sanctification? To be set apart. I was formed in my womb, set apart wonderful, beautiful, with God's law in my heart, even though I didn't know the difference between right and wrong, yet it was still in there, righteous, beautiful, distinguished, and chosen. That's what that word means. Every baby. Psalm 4.3 But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself, and hears when I call him. That word set apart same exact word that talks about children being formed in the womb. Same word. All right. 
what we talked about. Like, come on out, Washington. I'm skipping a little bit. The children were so evil with imputed sin. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 really couldn't apply. Because it says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, but in evil be infants. Infants are born evil. They can't choose good. That's why we're told to become like them. Doesn't make sense, does it? I know some of you may be Calvinistic in nature. I don't hold it against you. I was once a hyper-Calvinist. <laughs> now I'm just a hyper-person. Could be the coffee. I don't know. But I have been fasting, you know, the coffee. That's why I'm falling asleep. I did have a hot chocolate this morning. I wanted the milkshake. <laughs> so what's the point of all of this? Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Back to our text. Cain disobeyed God. We don't know what he did. And then through all this work and plowing the field, brought an offering to the Lord and said, look what I did. Here it is. God said, I have no regard for you nor your offering. Because it's the character of the man, not the offering that counts. Abel brought some of the first firstlings of his flocks. But he was obedient to the Lord. He had faith in God. And God received his offering. Every one of us in this room today and every person on the planet are faced with a choice. I'm going to please God. Or I'm going to serve myself. And if your desire is to please God and you have faith in the Lord God, no matter what offering you bring, He's going to receive it. But if you're trying to earn His love through your own works, just like Cain's offering, He's going to reject it. God bless you. Why don't we stand? So next week, uh, we will get back to our text. Boy, I sure had every intention of finishing chapter 4 today. You're like, sure you did. We made it to chapter 4. Verse 5. <laughs> so next week we'll get into chapter 4, verse 6, finish the chapter, and get into chapter uh, 5. If you need prayer, the elders will be out to pray with you. Uh, God bless you. Let's uh, and to get a worship. Aren't you glad that he died for you? There's no one for everyone that loved them. We say amen and amen to that message this morning. So wonderful. Thank you, Pastor. Praise God.
loving God. Because before the foundation of the world, He chose us. Lord, that we can stand before you today and give you our heart and give you our soul. Lord, I pray that you would go before each person here this week, God, that we would be pleasing to you, that we would make choices, that we're going to serve the living God. Lord, that we would choose to follow you, that we would shine your light to the lost and hurting world. And Lord, I do pray that you would draw all men unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And don't forget, we have potluck and night of worship tonight at the Water District, 5 p.m. God bless you.